My name is Jumoke Fagure, and with me we have three very knowledgeable panelists um, who I'll be introducing very shortly. But before I get started, um, this is the Owando International Women's Day webinar, and today we'll be discussing gender equality versus gender equity. What do women actually want? So um, a bit of housekeeping. So if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We also have a chat box if you'd like to join the conversation and make your comments and meet other um, members listening. Then also, you can also tweet at us. Um, our hashtag is Owando IWD webinar, and our Twitter handle is at Owando underscore PLC. At our Instagram handle is also Orlando underscore PLC, and we're live streaming on YouTube if you'd like to join us on there as well. LinkedIn and Facebook, um, we also have pages there, and it's Orlando PLC. Now, um, in terms of why is Orlando having these conversations, um, we feel it's important, and it's something we had previously started, but particularly during the um, when we had when we were on lockdown and when COVID started, and you know, we felt it was important to have these conversations to empower current and future generations to challenge us all to think differently, whilst also striving to to you know change things and to impact our future. Um, Owando has also been involved in building capacity over the years and we've worked with communities, universities, tech hubs, and tech hubs from the World Economic Forum. Now back to our topic, as I said, it's equality versus equity, what do women want? And those two words are the very popular words that, you know, that we hear when there are conversations about diversity and inclusion around the world. And why is, is this conversation important? So I think we all know that gender inequality is a very persistent challenge. Women around the world continue to experience prejudice, prejudice at work. We remain underrepresented in leadership roles and we're also under, underpaid relative to men. And I, I think it's important to also you know, out, outline some figures. So only 6.7% of board chairs are women. 5% of women hold the CEO role. Um, there's a global average of 19.7% of board seats. Um, just give me a second, please. Uh -huh. There's a global average of 19% of board seats which are held by women. Then women serve as elected heads of state or, or government in just 21 out of 195 countries. And also in bringing it to Nigeria, only 3.6% of seats in the Senate and the House of Reps are held by women. Now, considering the fact that women actually make up approximately 50%, 49.6% of the world's population, this imbalance is crystal clear. If you've heard my numbers, literally we have 6.7%, 5%, 19.7%. So the imbalance is very clear for a gender that makes up about half of the world's population. So there's clearly an issue here. So today we'll be having a very well-rounded discussion with our panelists on the role of equality and equity in building a world free of bias, stereotype and discrimination, as well as proactive strategies to achieve gender parity. So now I'm going to introduce our very, very knowledgeable panelists. And I'll start with Mary Moshekwe Adeyemi, who is the Executive Director of Credit Risk Management at Goldman Sachs, and is also the founder of Visibility UK, which is a UK social first organization working to improve outcomes for black women in the marketplace through inspiration, coaching, community, and advocacy. Her work has impacted women at top tier firms, including McKinsey, Bank of America and Barclays, amongst many others. Then I'll also like to introduce Dr. Nkiru Balong, who is the founder and creative director of the Africa Soft Power Project, a media and events focused company, and also the managing director of IDL Strategies, which provides market intelligence and stakeholder engagement services to clients around the world. She's also the founder and coach of African Women on Board, which is an Africa led globally focused nonprofit organization that seeks to advance the narratives and improve the realities of women and girls of African heritage around the world. And we're actually um, partnering with AWB today on this program. Then finally, we have Hamzat Lawan, who is the chief executive of Connected Development, aka Code, and he's the founder of Follow the Money, 
which is the largest pan-African grassroots data-driven movement, which seeks to amplify the voices of marginalized communities and also promote accountability in terms of follow the money, how are public funds being used. He is currently leading a global education campaign to accelerate girls' education and ending girl-child marriages, starting with the Northeast in Nigeria as a Malala Fund education champion. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Great to be here. Thank you for having us. Fantastic. So we're just going to jump straight into the questions, and I'm going to start with Moshope. Um, as I said, um, Moshope is an executive director at Goldman Sachs. So Moshope, first question for you. As a young Black woman working in the diaspora, do you feel you have to work twice as hard as the average white male? What do equity and equality look like from that angle? And what would you say as a millennial woman, what do you want or what do you think millennial woman, women want? Okay, um, three, well, first of all, thank you for having me, but three fully loaded questions there. So let me start by saying, um, you see that, that statement is a popularly held belief, but I think it's always important to check whether it is actually true. So when I think of sort of my career, um, like, I don't really believe a lot of people can outwork me and that I've always been a really hard worker in that sense. But also, I've always been quite surrounded by people who equally work just as hard, whether they're women or they're men. So from that perspective, I haven't really seen necessarily a difference in, in performance based on, on my experience. But I do recognize what people say when they say that. So if I was going to offer you a different perspective, I would say that women don't necessarily have to work twice as hard. I think they need to work twice as smart. Mm -hmm. Because what then tends to happen is that we try to replace this sort of our lack of affinity advantage. So, you know, we want to build relationships, but usually the men that sit on the leadership tables. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes a lot more complicated to do that. And we try to replace that sort of lack of affinity advantage. We try to replace that with um, what we perceive we can gain or control by a performance advantage. So we say, OK, well, you might have this relationship with this person, but if I can deliver three times as hard, mm -hmm. then when I get when, you know, when my paper is on the table, I have enough evidence backing. But, you know, I would I would wish that a lot more of us are really thinking about spending that energy in developing the relationships that mean that people are willing to speak for us at those tables because it, it doesn't change. It's always about who you know, not what you know. And that has that's a lifelong thing and it hasn't changed yet. So um, so I would definitely say that I haven't felt I've needed to work in terms of perform twice as hard, but I have had to be a lot more strategic. Mm -hmm. um, I may be a lot more calculating in the way I approach in the projects that I take on. So I don't just do every bit of work. And so a lot, a lot of times when we think about the work that women do, you really have to question, you know, is it valuable work? Is it work that's adding to the bottom line? Are you mm -hmm. able to really identify, you know, that, the, you know, this piece of work means this and, you know, it's going to the board or it's, you know, it's going to have really good visibility or are you doing what I call office housework? It's all the stuff that nobody else wants to do, but you're keeping yourself busy doing it but it doesn't actually, it's not meaningful or valuable. Um, so that's definitely one piece is, you know, we really should move towards doing a lot more valuable work such that you can really identify the impact that you're making. Um, and then I think to your last question around like what do millennial women, I'm kind of at the edge of that, of that group, um, but I do work with a lot of millennial women. And I would say that really, what really sums it up is millennial, millennial women want choice. Mm -hmm. And they want to be free from the burden of expectation. So all of the expectations of what a woman looks like, feels like, sounds like, mm -hmm. um, how they should behave and all of that. I think millennial women are really, millennials generally are just kicking against the gold here and just saying, look, we, you know, what has happened has happened, but we move forward and we have a different, you know, we have a certain view. And so when you then see how that plays out in the workplaces, you know, they really want to see themselves represented you know at the highest levels they want not just to be number two but they want to be number one they want to be the leaders they want to be on the decision making table they want their voices represented they want you know companies and leaders who really care about you know gender both equality and equity because i think we kind of need both and we'll get into a little bit more of that later um, and they want to really see companies create an ecosystem that you know, really breaks through, breaks through bias, 
right? So that's how they choose companies, not by brand name, but by really what companies stand for. They follow leaders that they can believe in and so on and so forth. So I think the, the, the shape of what millennials in general, not just women, are expecting from our government, from our organizations, from our leaders, it's completely changed um, over, over the years. And I think that it would do, you know, it would serve companies really well to pay attention to, to how that is changing and, and, you know, and make those shifts internally as well. Okay, that's perfect. Um, I love what you said about strategy, because I find like it, a lot of women work hard, not necessarily work smart. So I think that is something that we can all learn from. And I think that just takes me um, straight to Inkiru who um, is a seat sweet woman and who may have had to fight biases for the majority of her career. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, what do you think women want, equality uh, or equity? And if you can also even just give us a quick overview of what equality uh, and what you, know, you think equality and e um, equity mean and how that has changed over time. Thanks, Jumoke. And it was really um, interesting and uh, refreshing listening to you, Moshope, in terms of your ideating of what you were th um, talking about. And I like the whole conversation that what you were saying about um, the lack of affinity advantage. And that is why women um, uh, end up working um, uh, um, twice as hard or maybe three times as hard. And then obviously then thinking about how to work smarter. And I guess we can talk more about that in terms of navigating, um, navigating situations, but also just considering, I'm in Nigeria, I'm in Lagos, and considering that even with, you know, realizing that there's this affinity advantage and how to navigate that becomes even a problem for women because, you know, like men are having meetings at, you know, 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock. And so, you know, you want to be in that room with them, all of that. And then you're like, okay, what if something happens? They will say, what were you doing there? Mm -hmm. um, and so there's so many conversations and so many um, um, issues around that. Think about, oh, the way we view a ball and the whole like men usually have mentors, you know, my Ebo, my Aburo, all of that stuff is part of, you know, Nigerian context generally, at least with Yoruba language, that's that, but it's across. And then you're like, okay, when you're Ebo who is um, a senior male is then saying to you, um, I like you then how do you how do you navigate that as a as somebody who knows that they require a mentor and a sponsor to actually advance and so there are really like really interesting complexities around how women um, navigate uh, um, in terms of why we work harder or why we think that we're going to get it by working because also in terms of that whole affinity advantage um, situation we sort of suffer in that space. We're still suffering, um, uh, you know, um, major biases, major issues because we're not able to engage in the way that, say, uh, um, a male mentor engages with their um, mentee or how sponsors engage. Because there's always that whole for for us, for women, many women, the situation is, you know, the mentor then says, "What's in it for me?" So that's you know something for us to um, think about as we um, as, as as we engage on this conversation in terms of equity and equality. I mean, Moshe already answered it. We we want both. Um, equality means that we're you know we're equal. We have the same you know the same access to everything. Equal opportunities at work, equal resources, all of that. But we do know that that's not the case. Um, majorly, women are sort of like um, uh, um, underprivileged, in, and it's across the world. It's not an Africa issue. And so we know that. While we may want equality, we don't have it where, you know, you're, there's a boy preference in many African uh, 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 um, countries. But again, it's a global problem. Let's not say it's a, an Africa problem. And so equity means then that you're able to then get the tools that you need to, um, um, uh, uh, to, get, to get ahead. And that's you know, the difference between equality and equity. I remember um, having a conversation with a bank who were doing strategy for a bank and they said that they didn't have, um, they didn't view life with a gender lens, that they treated all their clients the same. And then you then say, how is that possible that you do that? And the example that they were give, they gave was that, so for example, when I talk about loans, all you need to do is meet the criteria. The criteria means that you provide collateral. Man or woman should provide collateral, but think about it. So um, if you're, um, you're a, a girl child, you're born, let's say you're Igbo in Nigeria and you're born and you don't inherit property from your dad because um, in many cases, women don't inherit. Your brother inherits this you know, uh, um, huge piece of land and the property, all of that stuff. And then it's time for this collateral. 
where is your collateral coming from? Your brother has an advantage over you, which gives them, so at the end, it's not actually equal. Um, yes, the, the rules appear that they um, um, up, you know, look like they're applying equally, but they're not because there's, there, there's a problem with that situation. So that's sort of an example of uh, um, equality and equity in terms of how to actually sort of like for people to view those things as they're thinking about it. I feel like um, that's about what I was, I'll say at this point. I don't sort of overhug the mic, but I, I think you talked about a majority of my career uh, um, in terms of, so I didn't grow up, I didn't grow up thinking or knowing I was a girl. I, I, I grew up just being a human being and knowing that literally everything I wanted, I could get if I, if I read my books and I did well and all of that stuff. So which is what I did. Nobody, my, you know, family upbringing was like, every, you do the same thing. I didn't wash the plates because I didn't wash my brother's plates. That's how I grew up. We did the same thing. You eat, you wash your plates. But it was like now getting into the career space that I was like, oh, there's a problem here. I remember negotiating for, um, for, um, negotiating for um, money with, um, I mean, if my, the person who I was negotiating, if they hear it, they remember. And um, this is a senior person, and this was negotiating for an um, increase. And he slipped and said, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with the money? What are you going to do with all that money? Like, you know, it's not like you have a family. Uh, um, what, no, this is what, <laughs> so this is what we hear all the time. And so we obviously have been, you know, uh, um, in terms of the, the, the biases that we have to deal with at work, there's so many, but I, I think, uh, I, I, you know, I'll let you move on and then we can come back to discussing some of these things in, directly. Thank you very much, Nkiru, for that example. And I think, and I'm sure actually a lot of women would have heard that kind of thing where they're saying, yeah, yeah, woman, what do you need it for? Oh yeah, single woman, why, why should I rent to you? There's so many um, biases that people don't even realize like it's coming through. But yes, I think again, women, women sometimes we do have these issues. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for, for those examples and for you know talking us through from your perspective. Um, we're going to move on to Hamzat, our soul man on today's panel. And um, Hamzat, um, as a man that basically works with organizations that, you know, try to break biases, you know, for instance, working with the Malala Fund and also your work with, um, you know, Follow the Money, which again, is not necessarily gender-based, but again, it's working with people in marginalized communities. What do equity and equality look like in your field? Well, thank you so much. I feel honored um, speaking in the midst of amazing women who have done so much and who continue to inspire. Um, so for me, it's about allowing women to be women and not setting an agenda or setting a template for women. You know, just let women be, let girls be. So equity and equality for me is a society where women can be expressive and would not be judged. Where girls can live their lives to their full potentials, where they would not have to get married or be forced to get married as girls and become mothers instead of just being girls and, and making friends and going to school. Um, so for me this, and, and what would shape my perspective here is a bit of culture, a, and, and when I say culture, and a bit of religion. So sharing experience in, in Northern Nigeria, and maybe also piggyback to what happened during COVID-19. Before COVID-19, when we say that in various communities, underage girls are being forcefully married off, a lot of people would argue that it's not true. But during COVID-19, because of the lockdown, and then because of poverty. So before COVID, we were 80 million people poor. During COVID, over 20 million people became really poor. Uh, the workforce, 50% of the workforce, according to MBS data, shows that 50% you know, of the workforce lost their jobs uh, and people could not be able to provide services. So they didn't have income. So there was a lot of pressure in communities uh, to fend for themselves. And the only way was to prey on girls, you know, giving girls, forcefully, forcefully giving girls hands and marriages to all the people. So we got reports where family members were 
organizing emergency wedding just to collect bride price and marrying of 12, 14 year old girls. And, and sadly, some religious people have also used religion to take away the rights of women and girls from them and, 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 and keep you know, using religion to amplify that you know, there's nothing like equity or equality that you know, you know, they would use religion and say, you know, men is higher than women. And, and, and for me, it's really sad and unfortunate. But as an advocate, as, an, as a mobilizer, when when I engage in this in this conversation, and when I when I engage, I ask practically. And I think this is where knowledge and information plays a critical role. I would ask, can you show me in the Quran or in the Bible where this is clearly stated? And then they start checking and start saying, oh, according to this scholar, I said, no, show me in the Quran or the Bible, because you as a religious scholar is saying that this is uh, backed by the Holy Book. So here are the Holy Books, you know, show me exactly where it is clearly stated. So for me, equality and equity, let women be women, let them have their free will, let them speak their truth, let them experience their humanity and their humanhood, and let's respect them uh, you know, for what they are and how God has created them. And let's not see women less than how we see ourselves. And I tell, you know, I tell people that choose to listen that women are actually a higher being than men. Yes, I'm a man, and I recognize that women are a higher being because women are natural leaders. And I tell people, if not for women, I would not be here. You know, so don't design or decide women's spaces. The space, and when you look at history, women are the ones that first conquered territories. But because men who are scared and are weak are trying to change history, and, and they're scared and they keep you know, trying to force women to take their voices away from them and shrink, you know, spaces and come up with barriers that will limit them to emitting their potential. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I like the perspective you brought, which is a very holistic perspective. It's basically let women be women, do not discriminate against them. And for people who have used religion as an excuse for discriminating against women, I like the fact that I said, okay, show us where in the Bible, in the Quran, you know, women are supposed to be discriminated against. And um, I, I, was like, I actually like that perspective. And I do, and I want to throw out the question to the audience as well. Um, what do we think women want? Do we want equity? Do we want equality? You know, you can put it in the chat boxes, have a discussion over there. Um, what do we think, you know, what else do we think can, can make, you know, can make things more equal for women? So yes, um, thank you very much, Hamzat, for that response. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to our next question, which is for Inkiru. And it's basically saying that according to the World Economic Forum's global gender gap report in 2021, the time it will take to close the gender gap grew by 36 years in just 12 months due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This means it will now take an estimated 135 years to close the worldwide gender gap between men and women. Um, and at the current pace, it will take 121 years to close the gap in sub-Saharan Africa. That actually sounds very scary, to be honest. So question for you, Nkiru, apart from the pandemic, what would you say are the things that pull us back at, um, from making strides towards inclusiveness? And what are the root causes of gender inequality? Thank you, Chumoke. And um, um, Hamza, that was really, I, I was, again, like um, when I was listening to you and I was, when I was listening to Moshe as well, I was like, I, I feel very privileged to be um, um, in this session talking with, um, you know, um, yourselves. Um, I, before I sort of go to that, I mean, I, I guess the answer is also linked in my mind in terms of the unconscious biases. I'm going to talk more about that, but I also want to draw from what Hamza was saying 
around um, you know girl um, early marriage, child marriage, and for me that's a, um, a root cause of gender inequality, um, and it's a really serious problem. I I was recently speaking about this. Um, I think during maybe two weeks ago, because I'd watched, um, I'd watched a, um, a, a segment on some data, which sort of like actually connected child marriage to terrorism. And um, yes, like really serious. And I'm sure, I don't know if Hamza's seen that and I'll share that, I can share that with you guys later. Um, but the way they worked it in, in the Northeast uh, and Northwest of Nigeria. So um, young girls are getting married at um, 10, 11, 12. They're marrying and then there's, um, uh, uh, um, they're marrying, so a man marries four wives, they're 10, 11, 12. Each woman, each young girl can have up to seven, eight children. And so you imagine, and then sometimes they die in childbirth, remember their kids themselves. So um, because they're kids, they don't have that whole, like they're not mothers yet. So they don't have the natural mothering instinct, all of that. And so, and then they might die, but they too were kids as they were. So they don't know how to take care of children. So it becomes a, a self-fulfilling um, prophecy. So these kids are, you know, maybe orphaned. They don't have love. They don't have, you know, um, father, mother, uh, um, family to sort of like look out for them. And so there's just a whole bunch of young men, uh, um, you know, you know, sort of like, roaming the streets and they're very easily um, uh, um, taken by extremists who then sort of like tell them all sorts of things and you know they don't know what they're doing and so they then start fighting on behalf of an extremist who's washed their minds because they haven't you know um, uh, um, had love they probably had they're born in poverty there's no food you know their you know um, cognitive ab um, abilities are not quite as formed as they could be and so you see that they, this is a direct link from you know I thought this was really an important uh, um, uh, conversation for Nigerians to have and listen to because when you're thinking that gender uh, inequality is a women's problem, we're seeing that it's a direct link to, it's a societal problem. And if we don't sort of work at it from this point of view, the country is, I mean, we're already, we see what happened yesterday or the day before yesterday from Kaduna to, uh, um, to Abuja. This is, this is the beginning and it's already bad. It's not going to get better. And a core thing that we must be looking at is to how to sort of like fix this gender inequality thing, because it is, linking directly to having you know bandits on the roads because kids are not being raised people are sort of adult, like, taking on kids and sort of like weaponizing children and so that's a really serious really for me really serious issue and so it was refreshing listening to Hamza about saying to somebody where is it written in the quran where is it written in the bible that to me is a really refreshing perspective on something we must actually um, um push forward but again going back to the question which is like you know what are the root causes Religion is a core problem, isn't it? It's a, it's, I mean, we don't like to say it, but it's a really, really serious problem. I would say again on record, every street in Nigeria has a church or a mosque. We literally are the most treacherous people in the world. But yeah, look at our country. You know, it's a serious problem. Look at our country. Yes, we all go to church and spend hours in church, whether it's on Sunday, Wednesday, whether you're Catholic, Muslim, all of those things, we're always in a form uh, in a house of worship. Well, look around us and see what we're seeing. And so that is a core issue, I, I would say. I mean, culture, we blame everything on culture. But again, is it really our culture? If you talk to the elders, if you talk to you know, people, our elders before Christianity and Islam came in, they said that this is not how it was. We had a respect for women. We had a respect that there was a society respected men the same way it respected women. So some of these things were adopted from the colonizers as well. And so we've mixed you know, we've mixed some of the bad traditional things with the horrible things that we've taken from the colonizers and mix it into this whole, oh, it's our culture. It isn't. Our culture doesn't say all of these things. And then of course we have the issue of gerontocracy where you have old people, old people who should be retired. They are the ones in charge, you know? <laughs> What's up is laughing, you know? It, like in a in a continent on a continent where 70 percent of people or is it 60 percent of people are under the age of 30 i mean come on so these are the issues that we're facing in terms of why what are the what are the root causes and then we take all of the things that happen to us at home in terms of how we're raised the whole or women are sub, you know women you know in in church women should be subservient in at home you're you know the way you're raised the boy is preferred because they will carry the last name the women will be married off all of those things that come into our, you know, our, our upbringing and our mindset, 
we take it to work because it's the same people who are at home who are at work as well. And so the cycle continues. And so these are some of the things that we should be looking at when we're looking at and exploring the incidents and what why unconscious biases for Africa might be even more, um, uh, um, what's the word? I'll use serious than anywhere else because there's some really deep rooted institutional uh, um, biases that we, we come with from, from home, that we take from home into, into work. And those all play the you know, individual different roles in creating this chaos that we're living in. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that, Nkiru. I, I love the fact that you went back to even from home like literally, um, I was having a discussion with someone. I was like saying, yes, I'm, the boys are treated differently. You know, boys can play, girls should be in the kitchen. You know, like there's this unconscious bias that even from the home it comes from. So of course, men that see that, yes, we're at the top at home, as you said, they'll take it right to work and it also feeds into that. And of course, religion, which yourself and Hamza have spoken about, I won't touch on that too much. I see Moshokwe has unmuted. Do you want to add to this? Um, I was just thinking um, out loud, it was, well, I'm going to think out loud now, you know, as Inkuru was talking about even how some of that is perhaps even perpetuated by women ourselves in that we are the ones who predominantly like, well, as much as we don't want to admit this, we, we bear the child raising flag, right? We're the ones who, you know, um, we, we have a lot more influence on the mind of a child, but, you know, I've been in many rooms where people say, oh, oh, don't do that, you're a lady. And I'm like, no, don't do that, it's not proper. You know, that means it should be the same whether you're a lady or a, a man. And, you know, you, you hear a mother say that and you think actually you are the, you are the problem. You are part of the problem because you are, you're already teaching a young girl that her behavior is tempered by her gender, you know? And then just the, all these things around people wear pink. People, these are all very, very subtle things but they really impact like the way you show up when you when you grow up, you know, women wear pink, boys wear blue, um, you know, they, you know, women are basically taught to be risk averse as children and boys are taught to be risky and pushed forward. You're a boy, boys don't cry, go ahead, go and play, go and do all these things. And then you come to work and then you tell a woman to be risky. Workplaces are, are risky places. There are places where you're supposed to challenge and you're supposed to speak up. But how are you going to do that if you're not naturally brought up to be that way? So I think also, even as women and as many of, I'm thinking many of the women in this room um, are thinking about how bias is impacting them. We should also start thinking very much ahead as to how we're raising our kids. Because unfortunately, we are going to raise kids that are going to look exactly like us. If we're not, um, we need to move away from this whole unconscious bias, like let it be conscious. Be aware of the words that we're saying and like bring it to the forefront of our consciousness that, you know, you cannot say things like that and think it's not going to impact someone. And I was sharing with you yesterday when we were talking that I went to I went to a very prominent private school in Nigeria, girls school that used to tell me, you know, women are to be seen and not heard. And I heard that for six years straight. But I lived in a household where I was told to, like, share my views. So that's like completely like, it can be quite confusing. And then you, you grow up and then you start to think, okay, should I talk? Should I not talk? Should I, you know, I'm a woman. So maybe how should I show up? So I think it really just, you know, it's, we are all thinking about, you know, our own equality and equity in the workplace, but how are we paying it forward? Like, are we being really conscious about how we're also growing our kids? I think that was just a thought that was coming to mind as Nkira was speaking. Thank you very much for that, Moshokbe. In fact, as you gave the pink example, I actually have an example. So I bought a pack. I have two boys and I bought a pack of spoons for them to, you know, take to school. And of course, in the pack of spoons is plastic spoons, different colors and pink, yellow, blue. And of course, I just used to pick anyone and pack it up for them. And he's one of my son's teachers actually wrote to me, sent me a message saying, um, I don't think your son should bring in the pink spoon. And I was like, um, why? She was like, pink spoons are for girls. I was like, does him using a pink spoon make him any less of a boy? She was like, oh, I'm very sorry, ma. So even in schools, we have to speak to the teachers and make it very clear to them that boys and girls, yes, of course, they were different genders, but you have to treat everyone pretty much the same. Because even from, again, we're here, people are hearing this in their homes, they're hearing it in school, you're hearing it in church. And then they expect you to grow up and say, oh, yes, there's gender equality. Like, it can't work. It literally has to start 
from the home, from the school, from like raising boys and girls up. So I love the fact that you said that in your family, it was equal boys, girls speak up. So I think that is, again, something that um, we should all learn for the next generation, because I, I believe they're the ones that we also need to be teaching about this, because we have learned it, but we need to then, um, you know, pass it on to the next generation. So yes, thank you very much for that. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please type it in the Q&A box. Um, we'll be answering questions later on um, once we're done with our own questions. So please type in any questions you have in the Q&A box. Thank you. I see that a lot of people are also chatting in the comment box boxes, um, comment box and, you know, giving their own um, perspective on equity and equality and um, in Kira, I think you have an old student also chatting in here, said you taught them about gender and equality. So yes, um, gender and the law rather. Okay, so we are moving on to our next question now, which is for Hamzat. And we're basically talking about different African countries and then we're going to bring it home to Nigeria. So um, just bear with me as I read. So it basically says, Angola enacted legislation criminalizing sexual harassment in employment. Benin removed restrictions on women's employment in construction to work in all the same jobs in the same way as men. Burundi mandated equal remuneration for work of equal value. Sierra Leone made access to credit easier for women by prohibiting gender-based discrimination in financial services. Togo introduced new legislation that now prohibits the dismissal of pregnant workers from work. Okay, so in Nigeria, we can we can we do admit that you know there have been strides towards inclusiveness in Nigeria. Um, you know, we're not saying Nigeria is all bad, but I think recent events have shown us that we still have quite a way to go. And the two things I want to talk about is there's basically been a gender and equalities opportunities, equal opportunities bill, which has not been passed in law many, many years after it's been introduced. And then in March of this year, the National Assembly basically rejected a number of bills seeking gender equality for women in Nigeria. So question for you, Hamzat, and of course for the other panelists, once Hamzat is done, if you would like to contribute, how best do we rally governments to adapt sustainable and comprehensive laws in our legal and justice system and create policies that ensure institutions promote gender parity? Well, thank you, Chimoka. So when you reel out the data from all these African countries, what made it happen is not just about leadership. It's about commitment from their political leaders and recognizing the role of women. So let's bring it back home. Um, when you look at INEX data, over 50% of registered voters with their PVCs are women. When you even practically take um, samples during elections, when you look at people queuing up, over 70% of people on the queue during election day are women. Now, this month is International Women's Month. My National Assembly shamefully rejected series of legislative bill that seeks to ensure that women's rights are not only protected, but society treats them fairly. Um, I would try not to be emotional now, because I think one reason why sometimes we get it wrong as activists, as campaigners, is because we get emotional and, and emotions take the better part of us. I can, yeah, understand, you know, the sadness that comes with this decision from the National Assembly. But the truth is, it is now political. What do I mean? So when you look at political parties, the only role set aside is the role of office of the women leader of the party. In short, recently, there were some men who were aspirants and aspiring to contest with a woman for that office. And I'm starting with political parties, so I, I'm taking us somewhere because in Nigeria, our constitution does not allow for independent candidacy. So it means you have to run on that platform, which is a political party. And maybe I would even streamline it into the two major parties in Nigeria. Um, and then we move from political party and then we go to 
primaries of these elections. And, and a lot of people will say, where are the women that want to aspire into public office? Now, the dynamics are different for women. So if you want to even run as a state legislator, so state as a House of Assembly or a federal lawmaker, so House of Rep or a senator, when you declare your intention, the violence that even comes with you as parents or the societal uh, tag that they would give you as a woman, then when you go to these primaries, you have to start dealing with delegates. That's if the political party chose to run an indirect election. And let's even say you emerge candidate uh, you know, for the election. I've seen where propaganda is being run against women and saying, you know, uh, religious wise, any society that allows for women to lead is a doomed society. I've seen it even on social media. I've had it on radio. You know, I've seen even people on television make a case why people should not elect women. I wrote an article recently and I said, you know, I was waiting and I was looking forward to Nigeria's female president. And I was deliberate about my article, uh, which was shaped by Winbees as women in business who invited me to come and debate, you know, female president. And then I was inspired to, to write that article. And when I wrote the article and I published, a lot of people called me, men called me, you know, who believe in the same religion and faith as I, and, and was questioning my resolve and perspective to write and even make a case for Nigeria to have a female president. Some other people on social media even sent me DM and attacked me personally that, you know, this would never happen in Nigeria's history. I think as men who are feminists or he for she campaigners and as women, we must understand that this is political. So if we want to see things done different, I think we need to start putting our, our money where our mouth is. Because who becomes your representative, both at the local, the state, and the national level, would determine what becomes the issues that I we're passionate about. So if we're passionate about issues around equity and equality, what is our candidate as we go into 2023 election? Are they, also, is, is that, are they the issues that they're also concerned about? What are their ideals? What are their perspective and their commitment towards gender equality? See, political party would come and say that as if any woman wants to run, it's either some would say 50% of the form, they would have 50% waiver. Some even say the form is free. It goes beyond that. I think we need to start building a mass mobilization of citizens that are informed, that are organized, and, and that are willing to also contribute towards this kind of change we want to see. Because this change must first start politically. And I say politically deliberately because if I say let's even go back to our house unit, we've lost sight and we're losing values as the day goes by. So if we can get it right politically and put more women in public position with elective and appointed and ensure that men that are going into politics that were elected into position of authority are men that has interest of gender and has it embedded in their DNA. Because if we continue like this with advocacy, you know, with campaigns, yes, I give it all, you know, you know, shout out to women who literally shut down the National Assembly and air their grievances and got lawmakers to even recruit themselves with three of these bills, which they are still stalling to deliberate on and revote on. We must take it from a political point of view. And this is an election season. We cannot shy away from it. Yes, I know some of us are professionals or business people, we're academias, you know, we always say let's leave politics for, for politicians. But leaving politics for politicians is what got us to this point where we are. Each and every one of us must become politicians. And I believe if we are politicians as, as you know, as professionals, we bring a new dynamic and a new shift into politics. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm for power shift. Power must shift to, from men to women. If we really want to see change, if power does not shift, maybe Jumoke, you bring us again after two years to come and talk about these issues, you know? 
uh, and, and, and for power to shift, we must also shift ourselves to the grassroots, go to the hinterland and speak local Yoruba, Igbo, Hausa, the language they understand and educate them and use those words to inspire them to understand that. See, in the eyes of INEF and our permanent voters card, because right now in Nigeria, the only form of equity is DVCU. Because even our president has only one vote. You and I on this Zoom call, all of us say we have only one vote. So that is equity. That is justice on its own. So we can use this language and this communication to ensure that we can mobilize that kind of equity we want to see or make it more political. When it becomes political, then we can start seeing action. Yes, I know that you know institutions and corporations now have you know gender uh, policies. Connected development, my organization even have a feminist uh, policy. Today we have seventy five percent of management. We have eighty percent on our board. On the entire staff, we have eighty percent female. You know, and these are deliberate. So, so, but this is just one institution. We're talking about power, authority, influence. That is political. And, and we must start to engage in those kind of conversation. Thank you very, very much for that. And as you were speaking, um, what came to mind was, as you said, if it, if it doesn't change now, in two years time, we're, uh, we're going to come back and be having the exact same conversation. We all know that we're, you know, we're having elections next year. But for me, realistically, is this something that can be changed as early as next year? Because we all know how politics works. It's turn by turn. You've done your own time now. I've been here longest. It's my turn next. Women have not, we've not fed into that um, you know, that system where we're getting close to the front. So do we think things can change in the very near future? Um, I don't know if, in, okay, Hamza, do you want to answer? Yeah. Again, yes. Things can change. Okay, but how? Things can change. First, yes. we must believe, we must invest in that change. Numbers, politics is numbers. Yes. Women already have the numbers. Mm -hmm. So what it means is we can use the numbers get a seat on the table and start the change. 2023 is the power shift. 2027 is a game changer. But again, it's not a, it's, it, you know, it's, it's not just, it's a marathon. You know, it's a, we, we must continue. So after 2023, we cannot just go and sit down. No, we must continue and consolidate our various efforts. 2027, I believe we can have a few president, but we must start by showing that power using numbers and women have the numbers when you look at data and when you look at statistics. Yeah, I agree with you totally. I agree. Um, Inkuru Moshokba, do you want to add to what Hamza has said? Okay. I guess my question though is the fact that we have this battalion of female voters doesn't necessarily mean that they are willing to vote in a woman. I don't think that those two things are necessarily correlated. So it would be actually good to get Hamza's view on that because I also think that even when you think back to the days of, of the suffragettes, right? Most people thought, most women thought they were mad. So in many ways, there are times when we see these movements, but actually a lot of the people who are standing in the way of those who are making that change are women themselves because the picture of leadership in some women's mind is always going to be male. It's just the way it's set up. And what we're trying to do is really change beliefs and shift that picture. So then you see, but I don't know that. So to your question, and my view is I don't think it happens overnight. I think you, you, you get the, you see the data, you see the shifts, you, you, you pick on, um, you pick on the Angela Merkel's and the um, Jacintha's of the world and see how their leadership is different from their male counterparts. We see that, but we have so many blockades in our mid, in our midst. Whether it's religion, it's culture, it's you know the way our system is set up, the way our government policies that still you know pr you know prohibit a lot of things for women across certain industries and in, and in politics and in economics and the like. But I think that the journey is long because the problem is deep, right? So I you know it's it'll be interesting to see. I mean we're all here, we have our voting cards, they're ready to go. Um, but ultimately the point is. I, I always ask this question, like, do we just vote for women because we're trying to see that female leadership in the seat or do we vote for the person that we think is the right person for the seat? Um, because I don't know that in Nigeria we can afford to just vote for anybody because of gender. I think we have, we have, many, we have many problems, 
but you know, those are sort of my perspectives on, on, on the matter. So I, I can definitely um, come in and add, uh, um, so I, I do see your point, Mashapai, but I, uh, um, on this one, I definitely agree with Hamza in terms of, um, I think I, I personally don't have a problem with voting for women for the sake of being a woman, just because it's like I, the whole idea that merit, and when people say, oh, um, oh, are they qualified or can they do the job? But we see that the men are not doing the job. They're very ill-qualified. I, you know, the, the whole example, because when Nigeria, we'll talk about Nigeria, for, uh, you know, we'll use Nigeria as an example, and everybody wants to say woman, everybody points the Ziani at you and says, oh, look at what happened. I'm sorry, that single woman destroyed the whole of Nigeria, like just her, we, what was happening before her, what's been happening after her. In terms of, in terms of this Nigeria situation, things I don't think have been, you know, this bad. And this is, we see corruption in, like, it's gone crazy. And we're still saying, I mean, like, come on. So I would actually vote for women for the sake of being a woman. But and we're not, we're not saying women are better. It's just that if we're all bad, let's be bad together. Women are as bad as men. So we shouldn't be on a higher, there's no higher level. We're not claiming to be better. And I, I recently learned that as a way of thinking about it. I'm not better than a man. I'm just saying, as since you're there, me too, I can be there to do the same nonsense that you're doing. So let's do the nonsense together. Why must we be better? That's one angle of looking at it. But, you know, and that's just me being myself and being, you know, but boy, going to um, the point that Hamza was making about the one thing that we do have that we could explore is voting uh, um, and having this PVC. We've done a lot of work at African Women on Board around women as voters. And we think that that is one area that we have not explored as a country and as politicians, because imagine, you know, they say women or um, 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 women will vote for and will not necessarily vote for women, they'll vote for men. So we actually don't mind. I don't mind voting for a guy, a guy who does what they're supposed to do. So imagine if you're a politician and you understood the power of the female vote. So I don't think even, um, Michelle was talking about Angela, Michael, and all of those people, fine. But we don't even need them. What we do need to do is to get into the woman's mindset and say to her, look at your children, see what's happening to them. They don't have education. They're not going to school. They don't have, they don't have it's becoming hopeless for them. I will, I, if you elect me as president, will change that for you. Hold me accountable and then see what will happen. Forget about that plate of rice. People are so hungry. That's why we're selling our votes for rice. But if we go and campaign, on the, on, the, on the point that I will change your life, even if it's free education, if, whatever it is, and you can hold me accountable and we can mobilize as women. It's possible as Hamza is saying, and by 2027, we will, that will be the game changer. I, we don't need to have a woman in power. Honestly, I, 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 I will vote for a woman president, but it, for me, it's not about women president. It is literally who is going to do this job effectively? Who is going to change the lives of, you know, Nigerian women and Nigerian men? Because it's a suffering for all. It's just that women are suffering more, but we're all suffering more. So that's the point. I, I, I feel like, you know, it, 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 the whole gender thing is a very serious thing. I would vote for a woman president tomorrow, yesterday. But again, women control votes. We just need to change, understand our power. And that's what I think Hamza was talking about in terms of understanding that power. We all have one PVC. And if we all use this effectively, we could actually really be a force to be reckoned with, you know, whether we vote for a man or a woman. But imagine the power, once you recognize your agency, then you can move things. That's, you know, just a bit of, you know, my context from, from the perspective of Moshe Pray and Hamza, what you're talking about. Yes, I think, I think that's a great perspective. Everyone recognizing that that their one um, vote actually matters. Because I think that's a, a lot of... Um, that's a, it's something that people struggle with. They're like, it's just one vote. What does it matter? You know, they're already going to do what they're going to do anyways. You already know who's going to win. So I think it's, again, women particularly are recognizing that there is strength in that one card. And, but again, just to take it back to, I still think there's an issue because we, you said you will vote for a woman you know, because she's a woman. And honestly, you, you, you're changing my perspective because before I said, no, I'll vote for the people or the person that I think, you know, can do the job well. But you said, let's even get the women in there and see what they can do because the men are getting in there, right? Let's, let's see what they can do. But the problem is that, do where are the female candidates? 
that's the issue. We don't have female candidates now. No one right now is willing to stick their neck out because I think Hamza said earlier, you know, say, who are you? Why are you here? As in, why would we vote for you? You know, you're a woman. So I think, again, yes, going from the grassroots is important, but also recognizing the women that will go and stand and say, okay, I, will, I want, you know, to get into the primaries, I want to be voted for, is also looking for those women because we can't vote for women if they're not even, you know, on the ballot paper. So, yeah, so that's just a point I wanted to make. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, okay, so we're moving on to our next question. And we're looking at, um, you know, equality from, you know, the workplace perspective. So um, when it comes to implementing systemic change in equity, diversity, and inclusion within an organization, we all know that the leaders play an important role because if the leaders show that, you know, there's gender equality, if they actually push gender equality in the organization, then that helps everyone. So in order to see meaningful cultural change, executives need to be involved and they need to move beyond words and actually move into action. So Moshokwe, this is for you. Um, what strategies can leaders implement to break the bias in the workplace? Um, you obviously, through your disability, you work with a number of organizations. You know, what have you seen that organizations have done that has actually changed the narrative or changed the story within the organization? So, yes. Absolutely. No, it's a fantastic question and, and one that I spend a lot of time, you know, helping organizations answer. So I will, I will, I will put it this way. I think it always, first of all, obviously starts from understanding the issues and investing in, in, in the remedy. So be that however we want to put it, when you look at the curve of leadership, it tends to be male especially in, in, certain, in certain industries in particular, um, it, it, does, it does tend to be male. We do have a, a, a good number of female leaders, um, but they might not be the head honcho, or they might be the number two or whatever, but they are influential enough to you know, have a seat on the table. But I think you know, those, those who are driving change and what the decision makers need to understand what the issue is. When we're having conversations like this, a lot of people approach conversations like this almost from the, hmm, um, there's a skept there's a skepticism to the conversation. A lot of actually a lot of men think that the conversation around this equity and equality is is supposed to or intended to displace them, as opposed to um, improve everything for everyone. So there's sort of this negativity bias. Some of have this conversation it's like, oh my god, even when I was coming here, you know, um, you know, we posted it on my family group, and then one of my cousins kind of said, oh, when we're having this conversation, make sure you, you say that there should also be equality and equity in paying the bills. You know, so it's this mindset that when we're having a conversation about this is, you know, what does this, if you take, if you get equality and equity in the workplace, what does that mean for life outside of work? Does that mean that, yeah, women should also foot some of the bills, do all those things. You can't expect to you know, earn more and be, you know, in a leadership position. And then that doesn't reflect in the way our society views women and so on and so forth. So I think just approaching the issue, um, you know, with an open mind, knowing that it's not a question of displacing men, but around, you know, really creating sort of even, even barrier, you know, there's this picture, I'm not sure if people have seen it, but please put it in the chat if you have. If you search equality and equity, there's this picture of a man standing and looking over a fence and the fence is basically your, like your, your thresholds and all the things you have to bypass and then a woman is standing next and equity means she's given a stool not not you know not like just just being that you know she, because she's shorter or whatever she needs more support to see above the fence and it's it's just that picture to say that we're all trying to get above the fence but the guy can do it because he's naturally just taller and stuff and i think that's the picture we're, we're trying to take in the workplace so definitely when I, when, I, when I work with companies, I was always like, you know, be aware of, you know, where the biases come from, encourage learning, open conversations, conversations like these in big groups, in small groups, external and internal conversations, make sure you are having, you know, even like sort of, I guess, cross mentoring relationships. So where women are mentoring men, because I, fi I find that it's usually the other way around. Um, so making sure that you're seeing things from women's perspective, you know, ask questions and be willing to ask questions not to debate but to understand um it's a big difference when you're, you're you're kind of waiting to speak as opposed to actually i'm listening and i find that when men there's a perspective that changes when a man perhaps gets married and in particular when they have daughters there's something that happens to their brain where they're like ah now i see it 
because the problem is now in their face. The problem is now their problem because they now realize that if you continue to live in this world, it's going to impact the, the children that they so care and love. Right. So I think there's an openness that comes with that. But let's, you know, we let's not wait for that to happen before we, we kind of, um, you know, are generally open. And also for our female leaders, I think sometimes, you know, when there's sort of this, um, there can only be one mentality when we, you know, you get into the room and then you think that, oh, now I'm here, there can only be one. So there's no space. Um, or we think that because I'm a female leader, I cannot show bias. So I can't be found to be to favor another woman but how how else does it work you know how else does it work because it's that affinity um advantage that i talked about the way that our workplace is shaped today is because men hired men it's because ibos hired ibos and houses hired houses and so women hire women it's a thing my entire team right now i lead a tech investing team at goldman my entire team is all women and maybe in some ways not by design, but because I'm, I'm the lead, I think we just, we understand I'm the one that's hiring them. So, you know, again, I wouldn't turn down, you know, a really capable guy, but it just happened that my team was women, you know, but I can also see how that could change if, if the people who were interviewing were, 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 were different over a different gender. So yeah, so definitely, you know, understand the issues, invest in remedy. And I'll say the second piece would be really examine where bias and gather data. We cannot change what we don't measure. And we cannot measure, and whatever we measure gets done effectively. So one of the things that I've seen is actually start gathering data of, you know, at different levels. How do we recruit? What at what point in the in careers do women leave the workplace? And do they come back? Why do they leave? Not just like let them go hire someone else. Um, you know, at what point do they stay too long in a role? You know, why don't they get promoted? Why was the other person promoted? Really having those open conversations around, you know, that and even setting up panels that really track women's, you know, recruitment, retention, progression within the workplace. Because we need to be having questions at that level. Um, and then I think I would say, you know, really create accountability. A lot of times we just say, oh, we want to achieve this, but we don't actually circle back where are the results. You know, so you see what has moved the needle at companies is gov at a government level and the charter level having numbers. You know, when we started having things like the the gender, you know, the women at women in finance charter, the race at work charter, speaking about you know race in the workplace. When we started having things like you know you need to hit a certain percentage by X, we have that with women on boards as a as a global sort of thing. When we start having numbers that force compliance. And people are coming back to say, where are your results? That's where things change because no, it cannot, it can no longer be by mouth. You know, a few years ago, we had something in the UK called the um, the pay gap. That put a mirror in front of everybody's um, face because people say, oh yeah, we all get paid equally. And but when they brought the results out, and you looked at the average pay scale of a man versus a woman, wildly different. And people now had to justify and say, oh yeah, it's because they're more lower paid assistants that are women versus higher paid professionals that are men, and so everything averages out. But it now brings the question, why are there not women who are being paid, you know, the six figure, seven figure salaries? So I think the moment you have accountability on your data and you know that you're trying to hit something and we have charters that are really trying to make sure that there's compliance broadly, I think things really, really start to change. So, yeah. So just those three things, again, I would say is, you know, make sure you're understanding the issues and you're really, really investing in the remedy you're, you're examining. The second thing would be that you're examining bias and gathering data. And then the third piece is like we, we keep accountability at the forefront of things. We ensure we're reporting the work that we're doing. Um, we're, we're saying, you know, we were at 12% at this level. We're now at 15%. We're moving towards 40%. Like, what does that number look like? Because I think as we start moving towards compliance, it's clear that the work is being done. Um, and it will not always look immediate. It will not always look immediately like what we want. There will be failures. There will be the woman in the seat didn't do as well as you think she should have done or whatever. But that's all part of the teething issues. We will, as Nkuru said, we will all fail together, but it's fine. Let them be there. Um, and then we, we keep it, we keep it moving. And that's how, that's how people grow. And that's how we close this sort of representation, leadership and aspiration gap that we see. Hopefully that was clear. Very, very clear. I like, I like what you said about if you, if you don't have the data, then how do you measure it? If you don't even record it and keep track of it, then the, how do you measure it? Because you know, as you said, we can have these conversations, but if practical steps are not taken after, then we're basically going to remain exactly where we are. Um, Inkiru, did you want to say something? I thought, yeah. Okay. 
Not necessarily, but I could. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so yes, I, 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 I enjoyed listening to much of what she was talking about in terms of data and in terms of um, how to effectively move the needle. And I mean, again, I think this, this I learned this from the, the current US ambassador to Nigeria. And she said, I mean, we are as bad as each other. So what we need to do is to be in the room. And I, that really changed my perspective in terms of all mm -hmm. this whole idea that we had to be smarter, work harder. And if once we get in, we'll show the men how, how it's done. And that's for me, that's totally changed. It literally is, I, you, you, I'm just as good as you are. That's it. I'm not better than you. I'm literally just as good as you are. So I'm not going to show you how better to do it. It's just like, let's, you know, be there together. And that's, you know, resonated when Moshepa was talking. But in terms of, I mean, I would sort of say in terms of how do you move the needle as well? I think maybe just also working on this mindset sh shift that we're talking about, but not specifically in terms of individual um, um, unconscious biases, but also what is the role of, <clears throat> if you look at um, the, the whole conversation around gender equality, uh, um, it's been left to um, sort of government and the development space. And I think why I would say congrats and, um, and, and thank you to Anowando is because we have to start shifting the conversation to private sector. And as when once private sector understands that this is a serious issue for their bottom line, it becomes we'll see action. So when you look at what happened during COVID, we see how in, in Nigeria, for example, everybody sat up. It was literally the private sector that moved the needle with all of the things, all, you know, putting things together. And so I think, um, and that, that's what we're doing at IWB, thinking, working very, you know, very strategically with the private sector and saying, let's move this gender thing from a development world speak. Because, you know, to private sector, once is development, is social issues, women, ah, it's just it's women matter. You know, it's not that relevant. It's not that serious. But when we make it a serious business issue, you see how change begins immediately. You know, you were, um, Owanda was in the room and one of our um, partners when we launched the Safety in the Workplace program. And it was probably one of the most effective things that in terms of getting uh, um, thought leaders in the room, both men and women, to actually say enough is enough. Imagine if we do more of that, when men are standing up the same as women saying, you know what, this can't be, this is not proper anymore. And it's moving a little bit to the, um, the ideas around this unconscious bias is now moving back to the individual. When you think about, um, when, when men say to you, that, um, and Moshepo, you did give an example of, oh, men have daughters. And, um, um, but I'm, I'll, I'll turn it a little bit. You know, they say, oh, I love my daughters. And they'll say, I love my wife. And they'll say, oh, I have three sisters. And that is actually, I think, a key reason why unconscious bias continues to happen. Because when people think that they have three sisters and so they're fair, when it now comes to sharing your father's property equally, you don't remember that you have sisters. Suddenly your sisters become your enemy. So you see that having three sisters is not quite what it's cut out to be. And when it comes to having your daughters, you're the same man who is saying to your daughter, you must get married at 12 or 13. But I love my daughters, you know? So when it comes to you, it's not really that straightforward. That's why it's called unconscious bias, right? And so that's some way of thinking about it to our mind. One of the reasons that we must move and change the perception of gender is that we've been focusing trainings and gatherings on women. Women are talking to women. And so how about we change it up and men start talking to men about why this is a serious issue? Then the trainings will not be focused on getting us women to do better, to work harder, to be more educated, to know how to approach, to know how to negotiate differently, to know, you know how to navigate, to know how to do the affinity clinical, to know all of these things that we must know to be able to engage these men. Maybe we shouldn't even be bothered. It should be, how should men engage differently? because it is a serious issue and directly impacts their bottom line. If you know you're going to use your house as a man, you sit up. So forget about having your sister, your daughter, your wife, loving them all, that's all, that's nice. But let's now make it a serious, like when they know it's business or they might die, like COVID, we, everybody, it was no longer CSR. We're all like, you know, wear your mask. So that's sort of like, you know, my thinking around how to sort of like uh, um, uh, um, move the conversation to, you know, shift this mindset that we have been engaging on when it comes to gender inequality on the continent. Mm -hmm.
I, I think that's fantastic saying, oh, uh, basically you need to personalize it for people because if it's also, it's, it's happening for to those people or yes, I have a sister, I have, it's the same way. So I have black friends. <laughs> it's that same idea. Like once you, when you personalize it, then, you know, people sit up and they're like, yeah, what can we do? So this actually takes me to a question that we um, got in the chat box and it's from Osai Ojiho. I hope I pronounced that properly which and he or she basically says it is important for people to know how biases and stereotypes create different differential treatments and what policies and practices we need to put in place intentionally to counter negative narratives about women and girl abilities hamzat i don't know if you'll be able to take that question i can i can repeat it yeah please repeat the question Okay, so Osai basically says, um, you know, he or she wants to know how um, that, okay, so basically, we don't want to know how biases and stereotypes create differential treatments and what policies and practices we need to put in place intentionally to counter negative narratives about women and girls' abilities. Oh, thank you. Um, two or three examples I would try to give. Um, the first one was, and, and this example is me experiencing it, uh, because these biases are there, but it takes a conscious effort to unlearn them and recognize that they're actually there. So, so anytime I go out on a date, and even if it's my wife that is taking me out on a date, the waiter would bring the bill to me. Even if, so, so most, and, so again, when you sit with your spouse, they greet you, they don't greet your spouse. So if you're not conscious, you won't even recognize that this waiter is only saying hello to you. One, because the waiter think you're the one who has the more economic power and who would pay for the bill here. So sometimes you have to then call and say, oh, but you didn't say hi to my wife. And then, oh, sorry, uh, you know, I was carried away. And then when they bring the bill, I'm like, okay, give it to my wife. Because again, if you don't do this, this would continue. And, and then when you do it, they feel embarrassed. And I think I've seen some restaurants who have, and then I talk to their manager and say, you know, why is this thing happening like this? And then they, they invest consciously uh, and train their staff to do this. Another was when we had the community gathering. And I asked one of my female colleagues to moderate the event. One of the chief of the community came to me and said, you know, traditional wise, this was wrong for a woman to chair a meeting and moderate. And I said, this is my organization's meeting, even if it's happening in your community and with your community stakeholders, if you would not allow her moderate and chair this meeting, I would leave with our intervention and find another community that is more accommodating. And then he was sad and he sat down. After the event, one of the feedback he gave me, another audience was, I wish my daughter grows up and be like this lady who have moderated and shared this event. And later, because I am petty, I called him by the side and I said, if I had not allowed her and done what you have told me, would you know that this girl, or would you have prayed that your daughter becomes like this girl? So I, I, I'm telling him that left something in his head that probably would now make him understand that, see, we must create an environment to allow women or for women to showcase, you know, their talents, their capacity and their skills. And lastly, I'm really happy and sometimes in my bedroom, I jump when I see that CEOs of leading financial institutions are now women. I think one thing we've not deliberately done right is even documenting their successes and continue to create platform for them to tell us how they're steering the financial sector during an economic crisis, because they're brilliantly doing very well when you look at um, some of their profit margin and when they, when they publish you know, their accounts at the end of the year. So, so, so these are just three quick examples that, you know, that I, I can use to respond to my sister, Osai, who, you know, who is the country director of Amnesty International in Nigeria. Great. I didn't even know there was a connection and the question came straight to you. 
I like that. <laughs> what you said, because I'm petty, you went back to make the point and hopefully things, he, his mind, again, is a mindset issue. People's mindsets need to change. As in, why should you say women should, a woman should not chair a meeting? I like that. It, it's a mindset shift and a mindset change. Okay, so another question that we got from Isaac Lawal, who basically says, you cannot outlaw religions. We cannot restart the world. We cannot undo the damage that has been done to many women, many who have been stained to be inferior and have taken inferior jobs and tasks. Looking circumspectly at the, at the issue, please, what is the way out? It's quite a general question, but yes, but what is the way out of this? Out of women, being, um, who would like to take the question? Inkiru, would you like to take the question? I mean, I think that's what we've been talking about the, the, the whole session. Um, it's such a broad question, but I think the way out is this conversation. I think just having a clear strategy um, around, I mean, I, you know, taking it, as I said, you know, not making it a woman's issue, this whole Ministry of Women's Affairs. And all, I think when people hear women's, uh, women's issue, like, you know, you don't, I, I, we, at AWB, we're writing, a, um, we're writing a report on why women's issues are not serious issues. Because if you think about it traditionally, um, uh, um, think about period. Like, you know, when women are on their period, men don't engage. And so if women's issues is like, oh, it's for women, like they go into the kitchen, just thinking about all those things, they're not things that men seriously engage on because they're not even, maybe they're not, they, they feel they're not even wanted. So we have to also rethink the strategy, even the language around, around gender and how we see it. We put it in the CSR box. We, we you know, all of those things are um, uh, um, uh, uh, how we would be, and that's what we've been talking, you know, Hamza talked about it, uh, and Moshe Perez talked about it. I think that the whole conversation has been about that, but I'm gonna sort of segue a little bit to um, um, touch on a point in terms of um, what Moshe Perez was talking about around uh, um, active things to do when it comes to, um, you know, uh, um, changing conversations. And so when you think about, if you think about Nigeria or just generally everywhere, when you think about drivers, uh, um, uh, recruitment policy, it's not just senior people that we're talking about. There's also, there's, the, you know, uh, uh, um, um, lower down the cadre of people, there's drivers. Have, how many women drivers have we seen working for companies? And why is that? It didn't occur to us until we started doing this report around, um, around uh, um, how do you engage private sector? Because generally we think, that's an example of unconscious biases, that women don't know how to drive. And that is just something that we, we all grew up with. Like, oh, I remember you're being driven somewhere. There's a bad driver in front of you. The person will be like, ah, these bloody women. And then you go and look, and it's actually a man who's driving. And the person like, oh, well, he's having a bad day, you know? And so why do we have women, I mean, all men drivers? And why are women secretaries? You know, like, why are we not, when we're putting out recruitment, you know, we're recruiting as companies, do we actually say, um, 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 men and women applicants welcome when it comes to drivers. Would you employ a female driver? And why not? Like, are they driving at 3 a.m.? It's nine to six. This is a company job. It's maybe nine to six. Some people have two drivers. So why don't you have a woman driving in the afternoon? So there's just so many things that we can be thinking about. It's not just, it's not a removed issue. The thing is really, if you turn left, turn right, it's everywhere. So these unconscious things that we do, starting to unbundle them. There's so many things going on that we don't, even I, when I, I, was, I was like, would I recruit a woman driver? I was like, ah. <clears throat> you know? So we are all guilty of it in many different ways and we don't know it. And so like engaging, so to, to answer the question that came for me was like having these conversations, understanding, and as my shepherd said, measuring data is one of the things we lack the most on the continent. Like there's never any data when it comes to Africa. So beginning to sort of like collect data to measure the impact and so that we can actually know how to move things. Without data, we can't really do much. And so for me, that's a summary of how, you know, um, uh, um, hopefully to answer, answer the, 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 um, the question. Yes, I think that I think that covers it. I think unconscious bias is something that we all face. It's something that we constantly have to tell ourselves, you know, why are there no female drivers? In fact, you see some people, if an Uber comes and they see the, you know, the driver is a female, they literally decline the um the um trip and try to get another person again. Is that unconscious bias that we don't even realize that, you know, that we do ourselves. 
So it's even trying to understand that in the first place and then con working to, you know, to unlearn the unconscious bias. I think that is what is important. And I wanted to mention, non so on would make a very good point. He says, we must keep talking about these issues. We must keep educating and re-educating ourselves and our neighbors. And in this regard, he's challenging and encouraging everyone here today to speak to at least one person outside of this gathering about these issues. And I think, yes, if we have these conversations outside of, um, you know, this structure, webinars um you know series for instance i think that is something that will change things if we all say okay i will speak to one person about this and we have these open conversations i think again um that is that is what you know that is that is what will shift the needle um okay so also, we're almost okay Moshe, also, go ahead i would just also like to like i think sometimes we talk about i understand that bias can be unconscious but i also think a lot of times bias is just conscious we know this is the case. So as you said, um, I may not have thought about the point about female. I've never thought about it before, actually. I've never thought about it before. Wow, the driver's in my house, male. And then I remember one day calling, actually booking an Uber and the driver got there and it was a woman. And I think I just paused for a minute, not because I thought she was, I just thought, I don't think I've ever been in a car with a female Uber. I just, I just thought, oh, wow. And we had a great conversation and all of that stuff. And it was, it was fantastic. But I left there feeling quite impacted by that. But if I had had the choice and I'd seen the picture and then I declined the ride, that's conscious. That's not unconscious. So I think there's always this threshold of, eh, I don't know, to like, you know, and I think the challenge for all of us is to bring bias into our consciousness. So if we're going to do anything after this meeting is, you know, take some time with your favorite drink, sit down and actually write down some of the beliefs you have about certain things, about why certain things are. You know, a good one is sort of this driver piece, but, you know, what are some of the things? Ask yourself a question as a man, can I actually report into a woman? If you've never done it, ask, really ask that honestly and think what problem might you have about that? Bring that bias into your consciousness and then you are now able to start addressing it. I think we, we get so much of a pass by just saying, oh, it's unconscious, but it is conscious. You know, and the same goes for ethnicity, tribe, what, there's so many sort of aspects of that that we kind of, I think we, we get a bit of a pass just saying, oh, it's just unconscious bias, but no, we know where the, the line is, um, you know, or at least we should. And then, you know, if you bring it into your consciousness, you're able to say, okay, I know I would naturally do this with a Yoruba person. I feel more comfortable because we have language, we have understanding, we have this, we have that, we have that. There are many people in this room that will never marry out of their tribe. That is a conscious bias. It's not an unconscious bias. It's a conscious bias. So address the fact that you are you can bring things into your consciousness and then start dealing with it. As to why do you have those? What are the damaging effects of actually holding on to that bias? You know, what's the opportunity cost of holding on to that bias? Um, and let's start giving ourselves a pass on the unconscious piece because I think unfortunately it gets us into more trouble than we think. Thanks, Moshope. I think you are very right. Uh, there's unconscious, which most people say is unconscious, but there's actually conscious bias. Like people may not recognize that it is, but it is, um, you know, conscious bias. So yes, thank you for highlighting that. Um, okay. So just a very quick note, as we're wrapping up, we have about six more minutes. So I just wanted to quickly talk about, you know, the human. So basically in April 2021, when we went into lockdown, the humans of Orlando basically came together to, um, to form what we call TAP, which is the aggregator platform. And it's almost, it's like, it, it's, it's a body which seeks to connect charities with people in need. Because we find that there are charities in Nigeria, but they are not reaching the grassroots communities, the people that actually need the funds and the food. So basically what we did is we, we, we worked with a number of charities to basically connect them with people that required food. And um, so how it works is that, you know, the humans of Oando, the employees of Oando actually donate to tap and then using those funds, we then, you know, allocate to different charities who then go to certain communities. And, you know, that is something that has impacted, you know, communities and women and children. And it's something that we're very proud of. So if you'd like to join us in eradicating hunger in Nigeria, one community at a time, please visit tap www.tap to reach all. I will say that again, tap to reach all.org. 
Um, so uh, uh, then we're also on Twitter and Instagram at tap to reach all. Actually, we'll just put it in the chat box so that everyone can see that actually. Um, okay, yeah, great. It's already, it's been put there. So yes. So um, final questions for our panelists. Um, I, it's, again, it's a general question. We have four minutes. So you all have about one minute each. How do we act, achieve inclusiveness? through equality, through equity or both. Although I think everyone has actually touched on this, but you can just, you know, give your final thoughts on this as we wrap up. We'll start with Hamzat. Well, the Sustainable Development Goal team is leaving no one behind. So for us, for us to achieve inclusiveness, we must ensure and invest in deliberately ensuring that we leave no one behind. Be them women, men, people with disability, blind, deaf, you know, partially impaired people, you know, inclusion, it's ensuring that their voices are heard. Mm -hmm. So it's not about, the, you know, ensuring their voices are heard, but then the majority, you know, have the other of the day. No. It's ensuring that there's equity, there's equality, and there's some sense of justice. Because uh, inclusion would actually help us solve most of our social crises in, in, in communities today. Thank you very much for that, Hamzat. Inkiru, would you like to go next, please? You're muted. Okay. Yeah, I, just, I just realized I was typing something into the chat. Um, so I, I mean, I'll just keep it simple and say um, how treat people, if we all treated ourselves, let's go back to the scriptures. If we all treated ourselves how we want um, others to treat us, we'll be there. So man or woman, uh, uh, um, if we, if we like literally just did that and, you know, for, for people who are religious and for people who are not, I think that's how we would get there. Uh, um, just put yourself in the person's shoes and walk in those shoes and you'll see the difference that that will make to you, whether it's as, uh, whether it is conscious or unconscious, once you actually put yourself and walk in people's shoes. I think, um, what's that, what's that book? Um, to kill a mockingbird, you know, it said, um, you will never know how you um, how uh, um, someone feels unless you walk in their skin. So if you do that, I think that would be, um, if we have the capacity, mind capacity to do that, I think that would sort of solve all the problems, but can we really? But you know, that's a question for another conversation. Certainly, um, it's not easy. Everyone thinks they can until they act, until they're actually in that position. So I like what you said, put yourself in someone's shoes and someone's skin. And, you know, that would, you know, help with inclusiveness. And last, but by no means least, Moshope. Okay. Oh, very great anecdotes, you know, leave no one behind, work in other skin. I mean, I would say, you know, this, the, the concept of diversity is about seeing everyone is welcome. The concept of inclusiveness about seeing everyone is important. Um, and I think kind of keeping that in mind um, as we do everything, whether it's at, the, at politics, economic level, our firms, in our homes, is just making sure that we give space for everyone to show up and bring their, their thoughts to the table um, and for decisions to be sort of well-rounded. You know, we've had this conversation of equity or equality, and I hope we move to equity and equality. Because I think there's just so much space for all the, for for both, and there's the import is there, so we can we can bring you know the conversations around about around equality and have conversations with men and make sure like men actually creating space. We have policies and practices that suggest that a woman is no better, um, a woman is no worse or better than a man, and we all kind of have space. But we also need to keep the conversation around, you know, let's not forget the disadvantage that exists and where that disadvantage is coming from and then how do we in, you know intentionally level the playing field and that's where that's where the conversation of equity comes in is there has to be some kind of intervention it's not we're not going to get to equal by just saying everything because we're already we're already in a minus right there's was already sort of that you know inequality that exists so there has to be definitely intervention and that's the conversation that we're having and so yes i think everywhere and I, I cannot say enough like how it starts from home we cannot have equal partnership in the workplace if we don't have equal partnership in the home and that's on both ends so whether it is you know a woman cannot finish from work and then go and do another job at home right so men also have to kind of step up to this whole like family home caring thing the same way women need to you know financially also be there for their family and all of those things I think we also need to check what partnership at home looks like um, as well as sort of partnership in economic fronts. But yes, that's sort of my thoughts on that. 
Thank you very much, Moshokwe. I love the fact you've taken it right back to, again, charity begins at home. We start from the home and then we take it outside. So I think that's a perfect way to end this session. Um, so I'd just like to say a huge, huge thank you to the panelists. Um, we have Inkiru, Moshokwe, and Hamzat. Thank you for your thoughts today. You know, I've learned a lot today. And, you know, I'm hoping it's something that we can take out and also try to, you know, influence everyone and chat to other people about this. And I, I also, not just, I don't know, just want to say thank you for being here today. I also want to thank you for the work you're doing outside with your different organizations. Honestly, I don't know if you hear it enough, but we appreciate you and the work you're doing through your different organizations because that is what will make a difference. And people have to step in and do that. And thank you for being, you know, those people that actually push gender equality, gender parity in Nigeria and around the world. So thank you very much for that. And of course, I want to say thank you very much to the audience, you know, for listening, for putting in your comments in the chat box, your questions. We really appreciate you, you know. We, we couldn't have been speaking to ourselves. So, you know, thank you very much for participating and I'm hoping you've learned a lot. And again, I'll say thank you for the Orlando team in the background. Um, you, you don't see them, but a lot of work was done by them, you know, putting this together. So I just want to appreciate, you know, the Orlando Corporate Comms team and the IT team for all the work that was done on this session. So I think on that note, we can wrap up and everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Have a fantastic day. All right, then. <laughs>